guys, it's the Villa Man here, home theater enthusiast and all around tech lover. So it's finally happened. The Apple TV 4K not only supports Dolby Vision HDR, but also Dolby Atmos object based surround sound. Now I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who are wondering, how does a sound from Apple's streaming box compare to a 4K Blu-ray disc? Well, if you really want to know, then join me for a little experiment. But first, a public service announcement. If you like tech and home theater audio video and want to see more videos like this, then you've come to the right place. So subscribe to the channel now if you haven't already and let's explore this hobby together. You ready? Let's get to it. Now earlier this year I installed four Martin Logan in-ceiling Atmo speakers into my home theater. You can actually check out that video over here if you want to see it. And I've been using it instead of the upfiring portion of my Pioneer floor standing speakers ever since. I also used the Xbox One X as my Blu-ray player, but I was excited when Apple finally announced support for Dolby Atmos because now I would have the option of streaming my movies and having the same great sound as the Dolby Atmos on the 4K Blu-ray discs. But not because the Apple TV supports Dolby Atmos like the 4K Blu-ray players do means they're equal. Now I know what some of you may be thinking, if they both support Dolby Atmos then why would one be different? Well that's because the audio on the Apple TV is based on Dolby Digital Plus which is one of the successors to Dolby Digital 5.1. Let's make sure everyone's up to speed. Dolby Digital had five channels with a max of 640 kilobits per second, but its successor in the streaming space, Dolby Digital Plus, had a bitrate of up to six megabits per second, a 10x increase. It also supported up to 15 channels, with a bit depth of 24 bits per channel and a sample rate of up to 48 kilohertz. Now, disc-based Dolby Atmos audio is based on the lossless Dolby True HD codec as opposed to the lossy Dolby Digital Plus version found in its streaming counterpart. Now, the disc-based Dolby Atmos audio supports almost three times the bitrate of its streaming counterpart at 18 megabits per second. It also has a higher sample rate of up to 192 kilohertz as opposed to the 48 kilohertz max in the streaming version. Now, not because they support all these channels means we'll be getting all that in our homes. Things like dependent, independent, and legacy substreams are also factored in, which make things a lot more complicated. Both codecs, however, have a spatially codec substream of object data, which is used to represent objects in your surround system. So sounds of objects travel convincingly regardless of your speaker configuration. So now that we're past that crash course in home theater audio, let's get to testing. So for the test, I'll be streaming Ready Player One from the Apple TV 4K and also playing the 4K Blu-ray disc via my Xbox One X. Audio will be through my 5.2.4 home theater system, which is powered by the Denon X4300H. I'll also be using Room EQ Wizard to do the measurements with my mic. Wait, that's the wrong mic. Better. The Umic One is a calibrated USB measurement mic, which is pretty much a standard for acoustic measurement. And it's what I'll be using, located in my main listening position. Now first I'll be testing one ceiling speaker, then all four ceiling speakers, then a combination of the five floor standing speakers. Let's go! Okay, so now to give you more details about our comparison, we'll be considering the Blu-ray version of the movie or baseline, because after all, Blu-ray is the current standard. Now, this exercise then is to see how close the Apple TV Atmos comes to it. This involves playing the exact same portion of the film as our sample to do the comparison. In this case, it will be from chapter 10 when the orb comes crumbling down. This is a very dynamic scene and has a lot of overhead effects. The first comparison will be done with only the right front in ceiling Atmos speaker enabled. Every other speaker will be disabled. This is what that sounds like. This is what the corresponding frequency response plot looks like. You can see the two lines representing each source going up and down. The higher one being the 4K Blu-ray and the lower one being, in this case, the Apple TV. Now the x-axis, the horizontal one, represents the frequency of the sound measured in hertz and the y-axis, the vertical one, represents the sound level or SPL of the frequency measured in decibels. 
So the graph is then telling us the sound level or the loudness of each frequency. So now that we all know what we're looking at, let's dive in. As you can see from the first comparison, the Blu-ray disc has a higher SPL at every frequency. But loudness isn't our only concern. We want to see if the range of frequencies present in the Blu-ray version is also present in the Apple TV version of Atmos. And how do we determine that? Well, since the Blu-ray disc is the benchmark, we see how well the Apple TV graph tracks the graph of the Blu-ray disc. We already determined that the Apple TV SPL is lower across the frequency range, hence why the Apple TV graph is lower on the y-axis. So now our attention will go to the relative peaks and valleys of the graph. Let me show you what I mean. So if you look here at 50 to 60 Hz, we can see that even though the graphs have an average difference of about 8 decibels, the Apple TV tracks the Blu-ray pretty well. That means at this frequency, the performance of both are similar. That's not always the case though. We can see that there's a drop off here at 85 Hz. The same thing is true a bit under 170 Hz. Beyond that, you can see a difference in the relative peaks. When you compare the close relative peak of say 172.5 Hz, and then again, say at 177 Hertz, you can see that there's a delta, the change isn't the same. We first have to realize that if these were exactly the same, then the delta between each line would be the same. And having less of a difference between the lows and the highs is essentially a loss in dynamic range. This graph shows it does exist, but big picture, this isn't bad at all. Now let's look at all four Atmos speakers enabled. As you can see here, it's more of the same where there's a sound level difference between the two. There's also some drop off in some frequencies seen here too, at 91 Hz, 126 Hz, 233 Hz, among others. This will clearly be different based on the scene being compared. What's more important, as was evident in the first graph, is the compression of the dynamic range in some cases. This is the difference between the lows and highs of certain frequencies, which in a movie could help tell you the difference between a gunshot and an explosion. You can also apply smoothing to these graphs to make them easier to read, but by doing that, you can also lose valuable information which is important for this comparison, but this is how it looks with 148 smoothing. Now, if we make things a bit more complicated and look at the frequency response of all five floor standing speakers and the four in ceiling speakers combined, then we see that with just a cursory look, it tells us a somewhat different story. Unlike the Atmos speaker graphs that track pretty well, except for some cases, the plot no longer tracks as closely as it did before. Based on what we've covered so far, you can see that with all the speakers enabled, the graph is now an amplified version of what we saw in the simpler runs involving only one in ceiling speaker. But even so, the graph is very hard to read, so let's apply 148th smoothing. So as you can see, we've lost some detail, but it gives us the big picture. Again, it's more of the same we saw in other tests. It's even more pronounced when we examine the 300 to 600 Hertz range. In this range, you can see how much breakdown there is between the two graphs. Again, big picture, a graphical plot of it looks a lot worse than it is in reality. The fact that this scene involves an explosion with lots of rubble everywhere, I think means the frequency response curve should be all over the map. I've owned the Apple TV 4K for a while and I've been using Dolby Atmos on it since the tvOS 12 beta enabled it. But the fact is Apple is presenting a streaming substitute for 4K Blu-ray disc so there had to be some compromises. The specs I talked about earlier are up to numbers meaning that they're the upper limit of the specs. So in reality neither streaming Atmos nor the 4K Blu-ray version use the max bit rates available to them. During my test, the bitrate for the audio on the Apple TV 4K was an average of 770 kilobits per second and a max of 1.8 megabits per second. Now this is far below the bitrate of the audio on a 4K Blu-ray disc and it's not like I have a slow connection. 
So I mentioned I've been using Atmos on the Apple TV 4K for a while, and this test has actually proven what I've observed over that time. That even though Dolby Atmos support on the Apple TV is great and leaks beyond the Dolby Digital 5.1 it replaces, it's still not exactly equal to the 4K disc version it's seeking to replace. But at the same time, the difference isn't huge. When watching on the Apple TV 4K and I turn the volume up on my receiver, it gets loud, it gets detailed, and I feel immersed in the experience. It's only after comparing the audio of the 4K Blu-ray version that I realize how much more forceful and crisp the audio is. Truth be told, they both have their merits and pitfalls. Convenience versus dynamic range detail. This test method is by no means able to capture and display the intricacies of the differences between both audio streams and is certainly not the definitive comparison between the two, but I found it useful and I hope you do too. If I was to summarize the differences between the two in plain English, I'd put it like this. When I turn up the volume and watch a movie stream with Atmos on the Apple TV 4K, I wonder if I'm going to shake the picture frames off their hangers. But when I watch the same movie in Atmos on a 4K Blu-ray disc, I worry I might rattle the nails out of the walls. One more thing, if you're quick enough, you can actually get this extra digital download code of Freddy Player One. Enjoy. Until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood villa man saying, peace.